Good evening and welcome to tonight's Bible study. We have worked our way so far up to Galatians chapter 3 verse 15 and we will read from verse 15 through verse uh, 26. And the scripture reads, Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promise was spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. What this means is, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depend on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred to had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. For if a law has been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly come by the law. But Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised was given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. <coughs> Excuse me. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed so that the law was our guardians until Christ came that we might be justified by faith now that this faith has come we are no longer under a guardian as I mentioned um, Paul has been arguing the fact that the Galatian church has left the gospel message and that he was an apostle sent not by a man or by men and specifically that man would be Simon Peter, the head apostle, or by the, all the apostles that were before him, but he was sent by Jesus Christ, and that there is only one gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, by grace through faith, and that by believing in Jesus, the Son, the seed, that you are saved. And Paul then pointed out that he was called by God on his road to Damascus, that he then spent uh, three years in Arabia before he finally went to um, Jerusalem he met with Peter James and he saw no one else and then 14 years later so 17 years had gone by before he went to Jerusalem again and that he took along with him Titus and we have two books to the, to the Titus in our Bible that Paul wrote to Titus and that Titus was not forced to be circumcised but that he was accepted that salvation was to all it was freely given it was by faith and that finally Paul had to oppose even Peter himself for another word for Peter is Caiaphas and we see that in chapter 2 verse 11 that when Caiaphas came or when Peter came to Antioch where Paul was that Paul had to oppose him to his face and point out that he was being hypocritical by withdrawing um, because of the issue of circumcision and um, then enforce the dietary laws and Paul pointed out to Peter and to others that we are, we Jews are not saved by the law and nobody is reality is we're all saved by grace by faith in Jesus Christ uh, we see that clearly in chapter 2 verse 16 it says know that a person is not justified by the works of the law but by faith in Jesus Christ and so Paul then point out how foolish the Galatians were who started off by becoming Christians by faith and then now that these people are trying to impose that first you have to be circumcised and you have to observe all these laws that they want to gain salvation by means of works, flesh, law. 
And then he started with this argument that Abraham himself, who preceded the law, and that's where we are today, um, was that he became saved by faith. And so we see in chapter 7, it said, Understand them that those who have faith are children of Abraham, because Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And that everyone, Abraham and everyone in between, the way they are saved is by faith. And now he's establishing that, um, that Abraham's faith and the promise that was given to Abraham that all nations will be blessed through Abraham and his seed is the only way. And so we pick up in verse 15. It says, uh, let me give you an a everyday example from life that no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that is duly established. Uh, and what he's talking about is in covenants, uh, which is uh, you know, a binding uh, contract between two individuals that if both individuals sign and they have all the witnesses that may mean it's duly established that no one can add to that contract or take away from that contract the only way that contract can be changed is if both people that are parts of the covenant decide to change that contract and, and it's very hard to change because Obviously, um, the reason a person would get involved with a contract in the first place is um, they give up something to gain something and the other side vice versa. And um, nobody would just give up on what they gain. And so Paul says, let me t get this everyday example that no one would set aside to or add to a human contract that is duly established. So it is in this case. And then he points out that the contract that was established and in, in the Bible we see several covenants or contracts that were established um, and the, the one that we're talking about here now is the covenant between God and Abraham but uh, all the covenants of God continue the old covenant it does it, it cannot add or, uh, or put it aside and so if you take a, a big picture look of, of the Bible the first covenant was between God and Adam when when God was um, um, punishing Adam and Eve uh, we have what we call the Adamic covenant or, or the covenant with Adam where through one of Adam's uh, through one of Eve's seed through Adam that um, God, um, that he would bruise the serpent and um, you know the serpent would nip at his heel but that that seed would indeed kill the the, 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 the uh, serpent um, and that victory would be there and, and we see that that covenant is also fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ through that seed born of woman um, the, the next covenant that we see was with Noah and we see that God promised never to destroy the earth again by flood and, and that's a very interesting covenant because God is never going to destroy the earth again with a flood he never said that the earth will not be destroyed and, and that's why some people think in the future, uh, when the earth will be destroyed, it will be by fire. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about today. Um, we can get into that debate some other time when we are at some other scripture. Um, but again, the Adamic covenant has not been broken or set aside. The, 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 co the, the Noah co covenant, the covenant with Noah has not been set aside. And then the next covenant that we see is the covenant with Abraham. And we see that Abraham, at that time he was Abram, believed in God and it was credited to him in, by, in faith. And then he became Abraham and he would be the father of many nations. And that through his seed, all nations would be blessed. Paul is arguing here that the promise was not made in scripture to seeds, meaning all the Jews, but to his seed, singular. And, and that's the whole point that we see here. It says, the promise was spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed. So Paul is making it quite clear that this promise was made to one of Abraham's seed, and only one, not to plural seeds. And so not all the Jews. And, and that's the very point that Paul is making is that the Jews are not saved because they are children of Abraham. 
because they are direct descendants of Abraham. At, at least that's their claim is that they are special. They are the chosen people. Um, they are part of this uh, um, Abrahamic covenant. And from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, um, who is Israel, and done on through Moses and um, the promised land, etc., etc. And, you know, tr but we see that there are other covenants after the Abrahamic covenant. And that's what Paul is saying. Jo let's take this example. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. This covenant that God made with Abraham cannot be set aside and it cannot be added to. Just like the, uh, the, um, the Adamic covenant, the, co the covenant with Adam was not set aside. Specifically, that covenant is also fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The covenant with Noah has not been set aside. It is still in force. Ne the next covenant that we talk about is the Mosaic covenant or the law. And Paul is saying that the law does not put aside the promise. And he said that the, the seed, and Paul makes it quite clear, that the seed of Abraham, the promised one, is Jesus Christ. And that's what we see in verse 16. It says, and to your seed, meaning one person. And that person, Paul is saying, is Jesus Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. And God, God's covenant are never done away with. Um, he always keeps his word. Unlike human beings who would uh, go back in court and try to change the, the covenant or the rules or find loopholes, uh, God does not do that. God makes a covenant and he lives up to his part. Uh, always it is man that do, does not live up to their part. And so that's what Paul is arguing here. God said that until the seed come, uh, Paul is saying until the seed came, who is Christ, who is Jesus, um, that it's not to seeds, it's to seed, singular. And he said, so, for if the inheritance depended on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. And so, um, we are saved by promise, we are saved by grace, we are saved by faith. God promised that they, he would bless the, the, all nations, everybody, through this seed. And Paul is saying this seed is Jesus the Christ. The, so he, the, the, it begs the question then, and that's exactly what Paul does in verse 19. Why then was the law given at all? Why then was the law given at all? And he answered it. It was added because of transgressions. It was added because people are sinners. It was added because people sin. Even today, people are sinners. We are sinners. Until the seed to whom the promise referred to. The law was given, and Paul says, through angels and trust, entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, does not, um, uh, uh, however, implies more than one party. But God is one. And, and so what Paul is saying is that the Mosaic law that was given was given because man had a sin problem. And it was given to, to help with that sin problem. But once the seed came that the, that the promise was referred to, that it was no longer necessary. Then he asked the next question, that is, why was the law given? It was because of sin. Then he asked the second question, is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? And he answers it of, in the, so that there's no ambiguity. Certainly not. Absolutely not. The law does not oppose the promise of God. As a matter of fact, the law is what, through the law, even today, the law is, if, if you're not a Christian, the law applies to you. If you are not a Christian, the law, it, you know, some people will argue that the, the, the um, Mosaic Covenant is um, done in God. Jesus came, the promise came, so the law is no longer valid. But the reality is, the law points out to us that we are sinners. It's a mediator. It's, it, it serves a purpose. It's not opposed to the promise. It, and I want for people to hear that. Paul is saying, is the law therefore opposed to the, the promise? And he said, absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly come from the law. 
But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin. In other words, uh, scripture makes it quite clear that we are under control of sin. We are sinners. We are born sinners. We are born under the law. We are born sinners. Uh, each and every person, the fact that at, through Adam, Paul argues this in Romans, that through one man sin entered the world and all men have sinned. He, he argues that we are all born sinners. But the law, the purpose of the law is to point out that we are sinners. It was point out that because of transgression, because of sin, it's, we realize that we are sinners and that we need to turn to Christ, the promise, and accept God's grace through faith. So it says, the scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. And I, I like to say what one of my old uh, seminary professors used to say. Uh, God only has children, no grandchildren. Nobody is born a Christian. As a matter of fact, we're all born babies. We're all born sinners. We grow up and we get the law teaches us that we are sinners. The law points to the promise. I, for example, became a Christian because I realized I was a sinner. I needed salvation and I turned to God through Jesus Christ and accepted his grace and, and by faith was saved. And that's what Paul is arguing here. But scripture ha has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So we are saved. Once we are saved, once we have faith in Jesus Christ, the law no longer applies to us. And that's what Paul is pointing out. Once we are saved, the law no longer applies to us. We are saved by grace through faith. But before we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the law does apply to us. As a matter of fact, there are some people who think that the law still applies to them even after they accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior or as their Messiah, as the Christ. I mean, we have people, for example, the Seventh-day Adventists. They, they worship on the Sabbath. They follow the Jewish dietary laws. I remember when I was a kid, they didn't drive a car. They'd have to walk to church because the internal combustion engine is making a fire and you can't do that according to Jewish law. And they, they would walk. Um, they wouldn't play. Uh, we had a Seventh-day Adventist family live about three houses down from me. And I remember as a kid, I used to love messing with them. Friday evening when they would s get all dressed up, take their bath and before sundown and sit on their porch. I'd go play in front of their yard to, to, so that they can see me because they couldn't play. They were under the law. But here is the thing. We are not under the law. If you are a Christian, you have accepted Jesus Christ by grace through faith. The law no longer applies. And that's what Paul is now fixing to argue about starting this week and next week. We'll see that even more. It says, before, verse 23, before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until faith, until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So that the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. And Paul is saying that before Jesus came, the law was our guardian. I spent 26 years in the federal prison system as a chaplain. 26 years of my life. And I understand about guards and guardians and being locked up in prison. Even though I myself was not locked up, I tell people I was doing time. I was just doing it piecemeal, eight hours at a time, five days a week, sometimes six, seven days, depending on the time of the year. But here's the thing. Until fate came, we were held in custody. And uh, most people don't understand prison or what custody is. When you're in custody, when you're a prisoner, you eat when they tell you to eat, you sleep where they assign you to sleep, you are you are you are controlled by the guardian, by the the uh, what we call you know we call them correctional workers, we call them guards. You could use whatever word you want, but when you are in prison and you have a guardian, you are locked up. You have little or no choices, and as human beings, 
when we are under the law, we have little or no choices. We have to follow the law. But here is the good news for us. Jesus Christ paid the price on the cross. And that's what Paul is pointing out, that Jesus was clearly portrayed, crucified. Jesus paid the price for us. So we were all guilty and under the law. But by faith in Jesus Christ, we are saved. Jesus basically bailed us out of prison. He set us free. He, he bailed us out by dying on the cross for you and me. And I thank God because here's the thing. As a prisoner, I had no rights. I had no, no privilege. All that was taken under the law from me, from you, from everyone. But Jesus, the seed, the promise came died on the cross for you and for me and freed us but everybody is imprisoned to sin and death the Bible clearly teaches the wages of sin is death but thanks be to God through Jesus Christ we are saved and it is by grace we are saved by grace in other words we were all born babies sinners under Adam for as Paul points out un, because of one man sin entered into the, the world and all of us are sinners but once we come to that point we realize we're sinners we're, we, we cannot save ourselves by law cannot bring about righteousness yeah, and that's what it says for if the law could have given and impart life then righteousness would come by the law it cannot and so Jesus gives us a free pass. I don't know how many of y'all play Monopoly, but I, li I love the game of Monopoly. And you go around and you end up and you end up in jail. And then I used to like have that get out of jail free pass. So you land on it, you turn it in and you're free. That is what Christ did for us. He gave us a get out of prison free pass. Think about it. The very first thing Jesus re read was he said, today this scripture is fulfilled. He read from Isaiah to to feed the needed to set prisoners free we were the prisoners that he set free we who were under sin and death and so Paul is saying before the coming of this faith we were held in custody we were in prison they we had a guardian we were locked up with little or no rights and privilege um, we had to eat what they feed us we had to sleep where they told us we had to follow the law but when Christ came and now that faith has come we are no longer under a guardian but this only applies for Christians the law has not been done away with some people think oh the law has been done away with so we don't have to do anything we could do whatever we want and live our lives we are total freedom but they don't understand what freedom is they think freedom means license to do anything and everything they want but that's not freedom that's lascivious living. Freedom is to work through Christ in faith. And we will explore that theme more. But here's the point. None of the covenant has been set aside or added to. The covenant with Adam was not set aside. The covenant with Noah was not set aside. The covenant with Abraham was not set aside. The covenant with Moses was not set aside, the covenant with David was not set aside, and the covenant with Jesus Christ has not been set. As a matter of fact, each of those covenants build one upon the other. The law served a purpose. The law was a guardian and trustee. But now that Christ has come, if you or anyone, including myself, accept Jesus Christ through faith and turn to God through Jesus the Christ, we are saved and we are no longer underneath the covenant of Moses we're underneath the covenant of Christ that God loves you God have mercy upon you and even though you were in prison to sin and death he set you free by your faith we'll pick up there next week and uh, continue with this idea of what it means that we were in prison and that we were under guardianship and um, what that means for us even today